Hello, bonjour. Good afternoon to everyone at home. Welcome from the Canadian Museum for Human Rights in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Bon après-midi et bienvenue de la part du Musée canadien pour les droits de la personne à Winnipeg, au Manitoba. We have a very special program to share this afternoon. Nous présentons un programme bien spécial cet après-midi. Amon Chaliki, Interpretive Program Developer with the Public Programs Team here at the museum. Je suis Angeliki, conceptrice du programme d'interprétation ici au musée. Before we begin the program, I would like to share with you the language and accessibility features available in this session. Avant de commencer, je m'aimerais signaler les fonctions de langue et d'accessibilité que nous offrons pour ce programme. The presentations today will be in English. To access French simultaneous interpretation, select the circular globe icon in the Zoom controls at the bottom of the Zoom window. There, you can select the French language channel, and if you would like to hear the interpreted language only, you can select mute original audio. Les présentations d'aujourd'hui seront en anglais. Pour accéder à l'interprétation simultanée en français, sélectionnez l'icône de globe dans les commandes de Zoom au bas de votre écran Zoom. Vous pouvez y sélectionner le canal de langue française et si vous souhaitez entendre uniquement la langue interprétée, vous pouvez sélectionner « Couper la version audio originale ». As you may have noticed already, we also have ASL interpretation available for this program. To view the ASL interpreters, click View Options in the top right corner and then select Gallery View. Vous avez probablement déjà remarqué que nous offrons l'interprétation en ASL pour ce programme. Pour voir les interprètes d'ASL, cliquez sur les options d'affichage dans le coin en haut à droite, puis choisissez Vue Galerie. We also have both the English and French captioning available for this program. You can access English captions using the MIDI controls at the bottom of your Zoom window or by clicking on the link provided in the chat. To access French captions, click on the link provided in the chat. Nous offrons également des sous-titres en anglais et en français. Vous pouvez accéder aux sous-titres en anglais à l'aide des contrôles de la réunion au bas de votre écran Zoom ou en cliquant sur les liens fournis dans le chat. Pour les sous-titres en français, cliquez sur le lien fourni dans le chat. The museum is located on ancestral lands on Treaty 1 territory. The Red River Valley is also the birthplace of the Métis. We acknowledge with gratitude the water in the museum is sourced from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation. Le musée se trouve sur des terres ancestrales sur les territoires visés par le traité numéro 1. La vallée de la rivière Rouge est également le berceau du peuple Métis. Nous reconnaissons avec gratitude que l'eau du musée provient de la Première Nation Shoal Lake numéro 40. At CMHR, we are committed to engaging our audiences in respectful dialogue by providing a safe space for all. We welcome your participation with questions and comments. We ask that you stay on topic and be respectful of others as if you were having a face-to-face -face discussion. Thank you for respecting the rights, differences, and opinions of others. Au musée, nous sommes résolus à engager le public dans un dialogue respectueux en offrant un espace sûr pour tout le monde. Partagez vos commentaires et vos questions. Nous vous demandons de rester dans le sujet, dans le sujet de respecter les autres comme si vous avez une discussion en face à face. Merci de respecter les droits, les différences et les opinions des autres. You can use the Q&A section to send your questions for our speakers and the moderator. It will be open during the presentation and the Q&A portion of the program. To ask a question, open the Q&A window, type your question into the Q&A box and click send. We will try to respond to as many questions as possible by text in the Q&A window or in the live presentation. Vous pouvez utiliser la fonction QR pour envoyer vos questions à nos intervenants et à notre modérateur. Cette fonction sera ouverte pendant la présentation et la période de questions. Pour poser une question, ouvrez la fenêtre QR, tapez votre question dans la case et cliquez sur « Envoyer ». Nous essaierons de répondre à autant de questions que possible par texte dans la fenêtre QR ou en direct pendant la présentation. 
It is a privilege to connect with you for our virtual program today to mark Asian Heritage Month. C'est un privilège pour nous de, vous, de communiquer avec vous pour notre programme virtuel aujourd'hui, qui marque au Canada le mois du patrimoine asiatique. Now, let me introduce Yeni Trin. Yeni is the president of the Asian Heritage Society of Manitoba after being a longtime board member. Over the years, she has been a board member of various non-profit and charitable organizations in Winnipeg. Yeni was born in Vietnam and immigrated to Canada with her family in 1985. She's a lawyer and one of the founding partners at Mercado Trin Law. She has been practicing for the last 20 years in the area of real estate law, corporate commercial law, immigration, and wills and estate. Permettez-moi maintenant de vous présenter Yeni Trin. Yeni est la présidente de la Asian Heritage Society of Manitoba après avoir été longtemps membre du conseil d'administration. Au fil des ans, elle a siégé au conseil d'administration de plusieurs organismes sans but lucratif et de bienfaisance à Winnipeg. Yeni est née au Vietnam et a immigré au Canada avec sa famille en 1985. Elle est avocate et partenaire fondatrice du cabinet Mercado Trin Law. Elle exerce depuis 20 ans dans les domaines du droit immobilier, du droit commercial des entreprises et d'immigration, des testaments et des successions. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so honored to be here with you today to tell you a bit about the Asian Heritage Society of Manitoba and to open this event. The month of May has been designated as Asian Heritage Month by the Government of Canada in 2002 and proclaimed by the Government of Manitoba in 2017. The Asian Heritage Society of Manitoba, a nonprofit incorporated organization, has been responsible for hosting Asian Heritage Month activities in Manitoba since its inception. The month of May offers all Canadians an opportunity to learn more about the history and culture of Asian Canadians and to celebrate the contribution to the growth and prosperity of Manitoba and of Canada. I'm very happy to say that we are celebrating our 19th anniversary this year. We are thankful to have the support of Manitobans and Asian communities, such as the Japanese, South Asian, Filipino, Chinese, Vietnamese, Syrian and Korean communities, to name a few. We have also been supported by the Government of Canada, the Government of Manitoba, and the City of Winnipeg. Business sponsors and community sponsors, such as the Canadian and Race Relations Federation, Canadian Museum for Human Rights, and the Winnipeg Foundation, have also been very instrumental to our success and longevity. And of course, the volunteers who made it all possible with their tireless dedication and hard work. Throughout the years, we have hosted forums and panels regarding many topics of concern. We've explored issues such as discrimination and anti-racism, refugee experiences and integration into Canadian society, intergeneration relationships, Asian history and migration in Canada. Today, we explore an issue that is of great importance to all of us during this time of COVID-19 which is racism in the workplace. It has been a difficult year for everyone, as everyone has had to deal with the pandemic and related restrictions. It has also been essential, especially difficult with the rise of anti-Asian racism in Canada and in the United States. People of Asian descent have been in Canada for a long time, and racism toward us is unfortunately not new we're still seen as the other, a group of people that don't belong and who should go back to where we came from. This is happening in public spaces, in schools, and in the workplace. The Asian Heritage Society of Manitoba is proud to partner with the Canadian Museum for Human Rights to present today's panel discussion. Given that one of the missions of the AHS is to foster greater understanding and appreciation of Asian culture within the Canadian music. And together with the CMHR's mandate to explore the subject of human rights with special but not exclusive reference to Canada in order to enhance the public's understanding of human rights, to promote respect, 
to others and to encourage reflections and dialogue. We hope that today's discussion will bring together greater understanding and foster empathy. For me, as a lawyer of Vietnamese and Chinese descent, living and working in Winnipeg, this topic is very important and relevant. In my personal and professional life and through the Asian Heritage Society, I have seen and heard of events and actions that speak to the need to bring awareness to how racism and discrimination can bring challenges to the workplace. I understand that to combat racism, we first need to recognize the signs and the acts, to acknowledge the actions, and then formulate the ways to combat it. With a diverse group of panelists and moderators today, we hope to bring to you an informative and thoughtful, thought-provoking discussion. We have with us, and we're honored to have with us, a special moderator for this session, Faith Fandel. Faith Fandel is host of CBC Manitoba's Up to Speed, bringing you the day's top local, national, and international stories. Faith is an award-winning news and current affairs multimedia journalist, well known for getting to the heart of stories that spark meaningful conversation. Faith is also host of They and Us, an original podcast from the CBC British Columbia, inspired by Faith's own journey exploring gender identity. Born in the Philippines and raised in Metro Vancouver, Faith is a graduate of the British Columbia Institute of Technology Broadcast and Media Communications Journalism Program. Prior to joining CBC in 2008, they worked as a writer, radio reporter, and news reader in Vancouver, Kamloops, and Prince George. So please welcome Faith Fandel. Hello there. Magandang uh, hapon. My name is Faith, as you mentioned, and that's a very lovely introduction, Yeni. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, my pronouns are they and them. And uh, for the next uh, 10 or so minutes, uh, we're going to do a little bit of an introduction uh, with some of our panelists. Um, uh, before we get to that, though, uh, I, I'm so um, grateful to, to be part of this and, and so grateful to see um, a couple of hundred participants or so um, tuning in to, to listen to, to some of the discussion that we're having here. Um, the, some of the things that you're going to hear um, are, are all based on uh, our own lived experiences. Um, and, and that's the thing um, th that uh, you'll, you'll start to appreciate is that none of us speaks for anyone else. Um, it, some of the uh, issues that, that uh, we see um, happening around us, in front of us, um, are because of those differences. And, and I, uh, I'm looking forward to having this discussion because it is something that is, is very serious. It's something that, that affects people very, very much. Um, I, we have not uh, picked who's going to speak first, so I randomly just chose uh, someone. By the way, if you haven't had a chance yet to read, uh, head over to uh, the website uh, to, to get a sense of uh, who our panelists are, but we're going to hear from them. Let's uh, first uh, speak with uh, Jamie de la Cruz, uh, and you'll see in the uh, in the chat there, uh, a little bit of uh, who Jamie is, but but Jamie has decided, ha is taking part today. Jamie, can you uh, tell us a bit, tell our, our, our attendees a bit about who you are? Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Jamie Dela Cruz. I am a registered nurse here in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Uh, I do work out of a hospital setting, and I also am a clinical education facilitator 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 with the University of Manitoba. And, and welcome. Thank you so much, Jamie. Uh, let's uh, say hello to Maysoon Darwesh, uh, who is also here as, as one of our panelists. Um, Maysoon, what are you hoping to, um, to accomplish as we have this discussion today? Uh, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, it's very exciting to be here with all of you, these great people, actually. What I'm hoping actually is to convey a message of peace and a message of, you know, awakening that how could hurt and how could be very painful when you don't consider other people's feeling and just allow fear 
and hatred spread among people. This is my, my hope, you know, from today. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, let's say hello to J.R. Alibin. Hello, J.R. Uh, what, what, what stands uh, out for you as, as you uh, think about uh, what we're going to talk about? Yes, thank you, Fate, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Jerry Alvin, one of the co-owners of Max's Restaurant. Um, very much looking forward to the discussion. I think uh, as Canadian immigrants, uh, we have a lot to give to our community, both social and uh, economic impacts. And uh, I hope to, to uh, share that from my end, my own experience, as you say, uh, fit our unique experiences. And, but at the same time, uh, still recognizing uh, the differences that we are seeing um, in our city and around the world. Thank you. And thank you for coming. Now, you might notice me looking over here. Uh, that's because I can see some of the questions that you're, you're uh, asking us. So please uh, feel free, don't be shy, and uh, type your questions in, and we'll try to get to them uh, in a few minutes here. Um, let's welcome Muni Mysore. Muni, what, um, what, what comes to mind for you as, as you as you were asked to, to participate in this? And I think you're just muted, so we'll we'll get you to unmute your mic, Mooney. And uh, yeah, let us know what 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 sort of came to mind for you as you were asked to, to participate. I think you're still muted. Maybe click it one more. There you go. You're unmuted now. Well, I I'm very excited to be here, and I wanted to bring the perspective from the medical field because a number of our Asian workers are frontline workers in the medical field. And we have developed certain tools to combat uh, racism. You know, this is not new. They've been around for a while, but it, perhaps not widely uh, used. Uh, and now there's the opportunity to uh, revive some of those uh, uh, tools and, and share them with the others. So that's what I hope to achieve. And thank you for participating. Let's say hello to Alec Carlos. Alec, uh, hello. You you have a, a unique perspective as well. What comes to mind for you as we get ready to talk about this? Basically, well, when I got the the email or the call, um, I was like, oh, okay, cool. This the, it's a great opportunity to share my own experience, uh, especially as an immigrant coming here in 2005 with my family, growing up in Steinbeck as well, a little small town, just about 45 minutes away from here, uh, sharing my story, and not only that, but the the stories of the people I know personally that don't necessarily have that platform, have that voice. And as well, you know, it, the whole thing here uh, is to remind people because sometimes uh, I've said this before, uh, how to deal with this and, and how to really approach the situation anti-Asian Asian racism. Is always, it, it's, it's not always kind of in the forefront. It's, it's, it's in the back. And so it's kind of using this to remind people, hey, this exists. And it is a problem. And so, yeah. And also to put a spotlight on the film industry here, because they're doing great right now in the way that they're dealing with the pandemic. Oh, chef's kiss. It's great. And we'll, we'll get back to that conversation. Uh, let's uh, welcome Tina Chen. Uh, last but not the least. Hello, Tina. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm so thrilled to be able to join this panel today. Um, so I am a professor of Chinese history at the University of Manitoba. And I guess today I'm what I'm most excited about is, you know, I have a job where I get to talk with others, learn from others, research, teach about race and anti-racism um, in the context of Asian and global context. So that's what I get to do. And, you know, that's always, you know, it's compelling. It can often be difficult work, but I think what we've, I've seen, particularly over the last few years, I heightened by COVID, but particularly in the last few years, is the way in which the experiences, both teaching on this, re doing research in these fields, but also being part of um, university committees, trying to do the work institutionally, and work I do out in the community and the Asian communities and other um, with other um, groups, trying to think about how those come together. And so much of it often comes back to how we listen, learn, and work with each other, how we think together. And so having an opportunity with a new group of people to think with you um, is just fantastic. We we're so glad that you're taking part uh, in this. And you're right. It is, uh, th there are lots of different layers to, to this conversation. I want to go back to Alec. You were talking about how um, the, you wanted to, to sort of give the perspective of, of uh, the place that you work at. Can you tell, uh, describe what it's like working in the industry for you and um, what those interactions are like? Mm -hmm. So basically as an actor, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not a, 
cemented thing that you're going to have a role or you're going to have the next thing right and so to just keep that going and the thing with hollywood and, and just the film industry in the past is that there was a lack of diversity and so people like me there's a glass ceiling that needs to be shattered and it's there still but i do believe that this decade is a great way you know it's it's already cracking and i think by the end of the decade it will shatter and next thing you know like oh where'd it go Oh, it's down there. You know, it's 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 gone. And to put a spotlight on that and to change that, because yeah, there wasn't a great representation of the Asian community in film before. You know, it was always kind of resulting to stereotypes or or anything like that. And so, as an actor, it's scary because I don't want to be typecasted. I don't want to be stuck in that. I want to be at the top as everyone wants to be. You know, they want to create something that they're they're really proud of and something at the level that they want to achieve. And I think now it's changing. And even on set, uh, when I'm passing people, when I'm talking to people, they're very respectful. They're very, very respectful. But even even then, uh, like I said uh, before in, in the past, racism doesn't have to be, you know, full frontal. It doesn't have to be said. It can be muttered under somebody's breath. It can be thought. And you will never know because they didn't say it to your face. And so it's it's... That is how the industry is sometimes. And so just to change that idea, the ideology of that is is a big goal, I think. Is it changing fast enough, do you think? For I mean, you, you, I, I'm, I'm sort of picking up a more um, optimistic vibe from you. Is, yeah. is, is that an accurate <laughs> observation? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I really do think so. I mean, uh, just looking at recent releases um, in general in mainstream media, and then there's a lot of releases as well in the more independent film circuit. Uh, for example, one film called Driveways, and it's centered on an Asian single mother and a child, but it, you know, it didn't have anything to do with anything, you know, stereotypical. These are Asian Americans, yes, but it's not pointed out that, you know, that's it's not just their race. That's not why they're in the middle of the story. It's an Asian American story. And so things like that, that's, that's shifting. That's for sure. And so bit by bit, it'll get uh, into that mainstream um, stream, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I'm very optimistic. And for me as, as an actor in general, the auditions that I've been getting and the roles that I've been getting, I've been very fortunate. Uh, Dr. Muni Mysore, um, we, we heard Alec talk about uh, how things are changing and, and, and Alec is in an industry that uh, is very public. Um, what about uh, industries where folks are not so public? They, they might deal with the public, but their work is, is really very um, insulated and there, there are silos everywhere. What, what sorts of experiences have you heard about or have, have, have you um, seen? And we'll just get you to unmute your mic, uh, Dr. Mysore. And there we go. Go ahead. In terms of, um, you know, employment at different levels, like at the physician level and the frontline workers, it depends to a large extent on demand and supply. So if there is a need for, let's say, in my field, psychiatrists, and there aren't any mainstream uh, applicants, uh, and you're equally qualified, uh, you know, they, they, would, they don't mind accepting you. But if you look at what happened in, in UK when uh, the European Union opened up and a lot of uh, Polish doctors, white doctors came to uh, UK, then uh, suddenly the qualified East Indian doctors were no longer uh, popular. So I'm just going worldwide. I'm not just focusing here. So the concept of demand and supplies is, is there in a very big part of hiring. And once hired, um, you know, the young people, they take to the job, they're hardworking. But in times like this, for example, why is there uh, a recent uh, increase in anti-Asian sentiment? There's just no one cause. Yeah, we know about the endangered laborers. We know about the Chinese Exclusion Act, the, the Japanese intern, the war internment camps after the Second World War. It's not new. Recent escalation is primarily because of the perpetuation historically and contemporarily from the highest positions of office. For example, our uh, previous American 
um, president. And there is a certain fear that China is America's rival. China is getting to be the new economic power. It's going to take over as the number one superpower. I, I wanted to get that talk more about uh, what you're describing here, the, the supply and demand. I mean, it's it's sort of similar to um, what Alec is describing in terms of the glass ceiling. Um, JR, uh, you are a business owner um, here in Manitoba, in Winnipeg. Um, what experiences have you had uh, and uh, what have you done to try and um, create a more diverse and inclusive uh, work environment in the business that you own? Yeah, no, th uh, thank you for the question. I think um, for, for me, it dates back to my <clears throat> activeness in the business community going back to 15 years ago when I was starting my career as an accountant. Um, there was not a lot of accountants back then. Um, and I, you know, you, you notice the, not, not uh, I would say intentional um, marginalization, uh, but just the lack of diversity. And back then, I mean, I mean, diversity was not, you know, front and center. Uh, I think we're very fortunate to have this platform now. And I think uh, by having that attitude of, you know, um, I've always had this attitude of, you know, you get to continue to highlight yourself as a immigrant um, and that they see the character that you are. And I just carried that with me um, uh, along the way. And the opportunity came with Max's restaurant, which uh, my family and I uh, brought it from Asia. And uh, Max's is a big deal in, in Asia. There's... Um, there's a lot of stores over there. And, and uh, so when they came here, it was a big deal. So again, um, fr from, from my original intention of highlighting Canadian uh, Filipino business owners, uh, Asian business owners. So I feel that uh, it's an honor to, to say, guys, listen, um, this is what we do. <laughs> you know, though, this is what we can do for the community. Uh, we, at the very start, we employed close to 80 uh, people. Um, pre-pandemic, obviously, and then when everything shut down, you know, we had to lay off many, many of them. So, but that, that's a positive thing, right? I mean, uh, I remember at our, uh, at our grand opening where you got politicians and prominent people there at the store, we had about 200 people there. And they said, wow, this is what the Filipino community is about, the Filipino Canadian community when they come together, right? Like it's positive economic impact, social impact, there's a lot of positive vibes. So, so, you know, if, you know, highlighting that as well is, is um, showing what we can do, you know, for, for the community and not, again, uh, not just being seen as laborers, right? Uh, right. And I think uh, I, I feel fortunate for, you know, having lived there for 25 years. And, um, and I, I think Max has been fortunate to be uh, a catalyst for, giving back and we've been giving back uh, to our frontline and healthcare workers since the pandemic began and we're gonna continue doing that, so. Thank you for that, JR. Uh, we are taking your questions and I see uh, folks have been uh, uh, typing them in and sending them in. Uh, I, I wanna go to one of, our, one of the questions from uh, Margarita. Margarita writes, hi Faith, hi panelists, I'm Margarita. Born and raised in the Philippines, my family and I came to Canada in 2005. I still struggle with the feeling that I don't belong here in Winnipeg or in Canada in general, even though my family and I have been here for a long time. I still struggle with trying to fit in here in Canada, even though um, my family has been here for all this time. My question is, is this feeling of not belonging normal, even though you have immigrated in a place for a long time? Maysoon uh, Darwesh, I wonder what 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 would you say to Margarita's question? Yeah, I read the question actually, and I can strongly relate. Um, yes, this feeling will really stick with you for a long time, for a simple reason: um, you have the feeling of superiority from people around you. You even when they don't say it, it's always like that. You know, gesture like, "Oh, we brought you here." Without us, you cannot be who you are. Uh, without us, you would be where your family come from. Uh, these feelings really deep rooted. Uh, I will tell her this is normal. It's going to take time. She might never feel that she belongs as well. But 
It's the matter of whom she's surrounding herself with, whom her friends are, and how she's going to develop resilience to accept like we're not living in a perfect world, but at least we can try to be with people who cares about us. Um, until now, like um, I'm, I'm through my work, through you know my um, social life. Um, at this time, I have a great support uh, at workplace, even through my business, the organization I'm running. Uh, I remember first when I came to Canada, uh, the situation was different. I, I have a bachelor of journalism, but I have to grab any job I can get. So when I start working, I, I remember like the look, uh, the way how they used to treat me because I worked, I worked in multiple jobs until I, I get you know what I'm doing now. Uh, so yeah, they used to treat me as if I'm ignorant, uh, stupid. Uh, who am I? Uh, the moment I open my mouth, uh, oh, you have an accent, uh, where you come from. So this superiority just makes you feel that you don't fit in, you don't belong to, and it, it takes time. So, so that is uh, what, uh, what would be helpful for people like Margaret uh, um, for, from sort of a personal perspective. Um, I, I, and I know we'll, we'll hear from Tina and Jamie in just a moment here. I just say, I, as you were describing that, Maysoon, uh, it made me think about the privilege that I have. Um, you know, I, I work uh, as a journalist and I'm privileged to be able to do what I do in terms of having a platform to share stories. And I remember having this conversation with one of my close friends and I said, imagine if I talk like this, do you think that I will be here right now? And she laughed, you know, that really deep belly laugh. And then she cried. And I thought, why are you crying? And she said, this is, this is what I mean when I talk about anti-Asian racism. This is, this is what I mean. So it's, it's a question that I, that I reflect on. Um, Tina, when you look at uh, the, the research that, you, that you've seen, um, is that example that, that, we, uh, that we heard from Margarita um, and, and how uh, May soon described it and, and what I'm talking about, are those real things? Oh, I think they're definitely real things. And I think this is one of the great kind of, you know, it's the way that our personal lives get woven into the long histories of exclusion that frame being Asian in Canada and North America. And I'm always, you know, mindful and thinking um, one of the scholars, May Nye, a scholar of Asian American history at Columbia University, writes so powerfully. And she writes about um, the way that different historical dynamics have created different racisms. But she always reminds us that those legacies of racisms and the way they interact are always interconnected, often in complicated and chaotic ways, but it's that interconnection where we begin to understand the structures and the relationships. And I think that's where this kind of way that they're linked to stories of exclusion, um, the way that we can understand others on this panel have already made mention of the head tax, the Japanese internment, the logics of exclusion that some people don't belong. And then the ways that that exclusion also just gets layered onto the dispossession um, of, of land from indigenous people, the assimilationist politics. Um, and so the way that everyone gets pulled into these ways of who, of a question of belonging and so much of, you know, the institutions we interact with, our everyday interactions, our workplaces, and just as Alec already said, those microaggressions are ways of kind of expressing a sense that there are exclusions, that we're actually a place premised on exclusion. And we are always by physically being present, reminding people that that's not accurate, um, but our bodies bear a lot of the emotional labor and burdens on a regular basis. And I think, you know, as someone who works at the university, that's what I encounter all the time, where especially among students, multiple generations, you know, some are first, second generation and trying to reconcile why their experiences seem so different than their parents um, in moments of migration or newcomers to Winnipeg and how do they understand global histories that often were quite different. And so, you know, I think it's so complicated, but I think once we start understanding about, you know, different racisms are always interconnected though, that does also create a basis for us for thinking about how do we build solidarity across these different identities and racisms and then how do we can how do we take action because finding belonging is really important but in my mind taking action so that we're not just asking for a place um you know within 
already existing structures of racism. I think, you know, let's, let's, you know, take action to change those structures. The, the, the systems that exist and uh, does make it difficult, make it challenging, right? Um, but Jamie, I, I wonder, as, as you're listening to some of the things that folks have been talking about, um, what, what stands out for you? And, and do you have an experience um, that, I guess, that, that illustrates uh, some of what we've been talking about and, and, and what, you did, what you did about it? Um, so luckily in the healthcare setting that I work in, um, it's very, very diverse, very multicultural. So there is a lot of acceptance of everybody, regardless of whatever ethnicity they have. We all are there to practice and care for our patients and we are held to professional conduct. Um, so our priorities simultaneously become both caring for our patients, but also addressing concerns at that point in time. And it time permitting, depending on the situations with our patients, we can address it um, immediately in the next few hours, in the next few days, we have time to play with what we will prioritize in that point in time in the healthcare system. So in, in your case, um, you, you've experienced uh, it, um, a system that, that allows checking in and, and making sure that uh, if you do see an issue, or at least the, the person sort of down on the ground, if they see an issue, that they, that they can bring it up and, and try to try to uh, deal with it. Mm -hmm. So there hasn't been a situation where it's been outright racist, outright discriminatory against me or any of my coworkers, but it for sure might be different for other people. Um, but there are a lot of informal conversations, debriefings and meetings with our team, um, our managers, just to check in with everybody on how they're doing in the context of the pandemic, as well as just in regular practice. Hmm. Thank you for that, Jamie. Uh, we, uh, I am seeing all of your questions. So thank you participants uh, who've been typing in your questions. Uh, we will get to as many of them as, as, as we can. Um, one of the questions that, that uh, has stuck out for me is from Angela. Angela writes, in my workplace, I felt racism, um, describing how someone pointed a finger at them, uh, called them stupid uh, by one of their coworkers. And, and the question is, how do we avoid this type of racism? and uh, I, I'm not sure who wants to answer, maybe Dr. Uh, Mysore, how, how, what would you say to someone who um, comes to you and says, in my workplace, these are the experiences um, that I've had, uh, what, what, what sort of, um, I guess, what, how, how would you address that? And Dr. Mysore, I think you're still muted there, so you'll have to click it one more time. No, oh, I think uh, you need you need to click it one more time. This is the uh, the world that we live in these days, which is the the unmute button. There we go. Oh, am I okay? No. You're unmuted. Go ahead. Yes, I definitely hear many many stories of uh, this kind. the The question is, do you address it with the individual, or do you go to the administration and look at what uh, tools they've implemented? Uh, so a, if a person comes to a physician with a traumatic event that happened, I would treat it as a trauma. Uh, before we address, you know, what changes need to be made at the workplace, we have to take it seriously. The PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, especially through the generations, is very well understood now and how it affects the, the generations to come those that have lived with racial discrimination. And so when you talk about um, dealing with it as, as something that's traumatic or as trauma, you mean acknowledging that that what the, the person has described or experienced is actually something that's serious, that, that can have a, um, a bad effect on their, on their um, mental health and physical well, health. Is, is that what you mean? Well, absolutely. If you look at some of the symptoms, they relive the experiences, flashbacks of what happened. You know, if somebody hit them, the, they re relive those experiences. They avoid situations that might trigger that uh, flashback. They avoid, they don't trust people anymore. They're afraid of interacting or going out into the community. And this feeling of inferiority we've talked about, that not belonging, that's escalating already. That maybe I shouldn't be here, this whole imposter syndrome. 
you know, why are they treating me like this? Should I not be here? Do I not belong? Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask a, a question for Alec, uh, but before I ask, uh, th there is, the, well, I, I'll, I'll read out the question here now. I just have to find it here. So there is a question from Michelle who writes, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on the model minority myth. How has this impacted your experiences as an Asian Canadian? Um, I, uh, while you're thinking about that, Alec, um, th this is something that, um, uh, so I, I immigrated to Canada in, in 1996 or so. So I was, I think, 10 or 11, something like that. I'm bad at math. So something in, in that sort of region. Um, and, and this was something as, as a Filipino um, was something that was uh, very much um, inferred throughout my entire life. This, this model minority or being um, just sort of uh, just suffer through it. Um, uh, Th that sort of thing and and just saying yes and and doing things uh, so that you can be successful it's something that i've experienced uh, alec for you um I, I imagine you're a lot younger than i am <laughs> what 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 comes to mind when you when you hear that question and when you hear what we're we're describing so just from just from what i've heard in the past um from you know teachers and and, and coworkers uh, they always associate filipinos with good work ethic and it's so I kind of like adds on to the whole model uh, citizen thing, but in a way it's cool. That's great that we have a great reputation in that, but it's also, you know, don't label it just for one race because every individual is different um, in that sense. And so it's, it's kind of just like, great. I, I don't know if I should be flattered, but and it's still a label. Um, it's almost kind of like a, Hey, let's just let, and individuals speak for themselves and let their work speak for themselves instead of kind of assuming. Because if we assume, you know, then that's, that could just snowball into, into trouble, if anything. You know, um, what, what, what do you think is th this idea of a model minority? Well, uh, where, where does this come from? Sorry, did you call on me? I was. I did, yes. <laughs> I, I, I thought I heard my name, but I wasn't quite sure. Well, you know, I think the model minority myth has become incredibly important. It's become such a central part of addressing anti-Asian racism. And I would say very much so, um, we're seeing a bit of a, um, a generational divide as well. Um, I think across Asian communities about how we think and discuss um, racism. And the, you know, I think what the exciting, I'm not sure, confluence of the rise in visibility and I think awareness of, of us around Black Lives Matter in the last year, um, certainly in Winnipeg in Canada as we've watched the Idle No More movement and we've become more and more attuned through the Truth and Reconciliation um, commissions through MMIWG and all of this knowing and understanding more about anti-Indigenous racism has also created a context where as we experience as Asians, racism that's targeted uh, at people either for being South Asian, East Asian, Chinese, that we're also aware that the model minority myth historically came about to really divide and conquer. Um, it's part of political movements um, in the 60s that says, if we can show that certain people achieved by a meritocracy, that then we have the subtext or the other side that says those who didn't achieve, it's because of shortcomings for themselves. And so, um, and I think in many ways, um, because depending on your parents, you know, people's backgrounds, people's parents, particularly newcomers, worked really hard to make homes for their families. And they did much like you said, Faith, said to people, work hard, keep your head down, um, you know, find your place of belonging. And if you work hard enough, they'll accept you and you know and try to work with this and appreciate what we've given up to allow you that opportunity and i think that's a story that often gets very internalized but i think more and more um we're coming to really reflect upon how well we still know that anti-asian racism exists that often within Asian communities, there can also be anti-Black racism. There can be anti-Indigenous racism, sometimes for lack of education or exposure. Um, sometimes it's about the kinds of contexts and places they've come from, their own migration routes. But the model minority myth um, has really come to the forefront to talk about what benefits, what privileges come with that. And then I think for me in Winnipeg, it's been really exciting. I'm part of a group called Prairie Asian Organizers. Um, for Asian identified individuals. And we've been doing a whole series of teach-ins, um, workshops on the model minority myth. 
and what really is the movement to call for the model minority myth mutiny? Let's overthrow that. Let's think about solidarity. So um, it's, I think, just such an important place for us to begin and really grapple with what it means, both the benefits and then how it's kind of given us a way of only understanding ourselves through other people's categories. So who we get to be is framed by other what other people think we should be rather than who we want to be. And I think your dog uh, agrees with you wholeheartedly. <laughs> uh, we've gotten a couple of questions now about uh, acts of solidarity. Um, uh, maybe let's go to, uh, to Jamie. Jamie, uh, can you talk about, um, in your experiences, uh, any acts of solidarity that, that, that uh, you've um, encountered or, or something that you've uh, put in place in, in, um, in your life as you look towards being um, uh, tackling anti-Asian racism or hate? Um, well, for sure, the team ethic in my workplace helps me feel some sort of solidarity with each other as we're all working towards the same goal to care for the patients. Um, to be honest, I haven't experienced much racism personally, so I'm more on the side that I feel a lot of people I surround myself with are very accepting, are educated, are open-minded, and that, yes, racism does exist, um, but gradually we're slowly combating it. And with discussions like this, we just realize how diverse racism does affect everybody. Uh, uh, Mindy asked uh, the, the question surrounding uh, this idea of solidarity as well between racialized and marginalized communities. And before we answer that, um, uh, Dr. Mysore, I wonder what you would say to someone um, who, who describes what Jamie is describing, where they, they work in a workplace um, where it doesn't seem like, uh, uh, it, it feels like a very inclusive workplace. Um, what do you do then if, if you're in a workplace that, that uh, feels inclusive? Is that the end of it or are there things that, that one can do to, to verify that the workplace is indeed uh, inclusive and diverse? And I'll get you to click your, your microphone again. I think you're still muted. So just click it one more time. Okay. Is it better now? Yes, yeah, there go ahead. Uh, I really doubt that such a place exists. We're all very different people. You know, in I can tell you, it's very subtle in certain uh, professions. It's all there, at the highest level. Even and and so and so, how do you convince them? I mean, uh, th there are folks out there who, uh, and I encounter this during one of um, the meetings that I had, not at this workplace, but during an annual general meeting that I took part in. Um, I, I asked the question, "What what is the board intending on doing to to address?" Um, uh, anti-racist, um, uh, uh, homophobic, uh, homophobic, biphobic, uh, transphobic um, sentiments that, that exist outside, but how do, how do they address that from within? And, and the answer that I got was, uh, we have lots of gay people and black people and women who work here. We work in a great place. And, and so my follow-up follow -up question was, well, how do you know? And the answer was, yes, we take it very seriously. Thank you. H how do you address when when, okay. when you well, have that sentiment. Right. But I talked about tools. These are tools that were initially used in the healthcare field. Cultural competence now is part of training in psychiatry for residents. And this allows them to understand, you know, people of different cultures and how they bring their own uh, histories and their own experiences into their symptoms, because you may not know what exactly they're going through based on what is the norm here, which is the white Western medicine. Uh, so that has been around for a long time. There's another term which I like, which was coined in 1998 called cultural humility. And cultural humility is a concept where you are a lifelong uh, learner and you're critical of yourself. Self-reflection is part of it. You're humble. You don't think you know everything. You don't believe that uh, that you are the educated one, you should know it all. You, you co-learn with the person you're talking to or the person that comes with the complaint. And the second part of that is recognize and challenge the power imbalance in, in the, uh, it's, it's very easy to superficially say, oh yeah, I like gay people, I like, I'm, I don't have a problem with them. 
But then when you sit down and talk about the power imbalances, how are they really treated? Are they given equal opportunities? And then you see that you try to correct it, you challenge it, you try to correct it. The last one is institutional accountability. You have to take the institution that you're working at, even though everybody says I'm 100% satisfied with it, you know, a lot of people don't want to talk about it. So you have to give them a safe place to talk about these microaggressions or in, you know, that occur all the time. JR, I wonder, you, um, again, you, you are in uh, several different industries. Um, I, as you hear what uh, Dr. Mysore uh, describes there, mm -hmm. what, what comes to mind for you? No, I, and I agree with, with uh, sometimes it does start with the institutions that you work with, you affiliate yourself with, and, and um, as, a, as a CPA, um, uh, I've seen that too, not the CPA, but obviously you, you, you speak with people, you speak with colleagues, and uh, there's actually this uh, one business group that invited me uh, to join them, and um, Whenever and, you know, I looked at their website. It looks very white. Excuse my language, but uh, their board looks very white. Uh, whenever I get invited in those kind of groups or events, I always feel that I'm the token. You know, <laughs> uh, not only because I bring the the depth of experience, I guess my my years in um, in the industry and my visibility, but I don't want to be a token. Um, I have my own ideas and I have something to bring to the community. Um, and I think, um, and that's where I always go back to my, uh, my hardship as a newcomer in, you know, back in early nineties. And um, it was not easy. Uh, it was not easy. My, my father, my parents had the same, you know, uh, same experience like Masoon uh, said. Um, and that was, for me, I saw that as an opportunity, as my grit, uh, to fight towards, uh, you know, my, uh, you call it my own insecurities and mental healthness. Uh, you know, I think probably and, and listening to everyone, I mean, I think there's a direct correlation between racism, uh, your experiences in life, and mental health, and and we just never talked about it. You know, we never talked about that because I was treated very differently growing up. That that caused my mental healthness to be whacked so um but i think as uh successful people and i look all of us here in the room uh um regardless of the color but it, the, where, where we came from as, as asian uh, canadian nation and i think that's where for me i feel obligated i have a sense of privilege like you said faith a responsibility you know, to like, like what Alec is doing for the industry and Jamie uh, for the industry and everybody else, like we have a responsibility to represent, you know, the, in the sector that we're in and at the same time where we came from. And I think um, the confidence and the, you know, the security that we feel would be, um, it will transcend, you know, that, listen, I have something to say, you can trust me that, that what I'm saying is also good for you. Um, and that, you know, you know um, yes, it's great that you're inviting me as a brown person to be your token brown person to speak at events, but I want you to listen clearly on the message that I'm saying, because I have a lot to say as a, as a Canadian Asian, so. Thank you for that, JR. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left and I know we're getting many questions. Um, I, I wanna talk about the, the token um, comment that you, you made. Um, before I moved here to Winnipeg um, and I was offered the job, I, I had that conversation with many friends about uh, being a token hire. Um, yes, I publicly identify as a non-binary person. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I'm Filipino. There are lots of sort of intersections um, with, uh, with the layers of me. Um, and it was really difficult to, to decide. I really wanted to move here. I, when, during my first visit, I enjoyed my time here and I thought people were very kind and overwhelmingly welcome. Um, and uh, we still have 30 minutes, I was corrected. I'm sorry. Yes, we do still have more time. Um, and so th that was something that I struggled with, with this idea of being the token hire. And it wasn't until I had a conversation with a very good friend of mine who said, okay, uh, let's for a moment acknowledge that part of your hiring 
perhaps was a, a token um, act, uh, was, was tokenism. Isn't that who you are when you think of yourself as the whole person? As a whole person, yes, I am non-binary. Yes, I am Filipino. Uh, yes, I have these privileges. And that's, that's what makes me who I am. Um, and so that, that's what allowed me to sort of say, yes, of course, I'd love to come to, to Winnipeg and, and work there. Um, Alec, in, in your experiences, is uh, the idea of tokenism, is that something that, that you've experienced and, and how have you addressed it or dealt with it? So it hasn't like been said to me straight up, but obviously with the, with the, you know, the history of film, there's always like a token minority or something in, in most films. And now of course it is changing, but I can't help sometimes to just think like when I get a role, I'm like how many other, you know, colored people are going to be there? Who, who are the leads? Is, are they colored as well? Am I just here because they needed to fill a quota? Or something, and so that's always that's running running in my head, and and even now it's kind of up in the air because I won't know until I'm on set, or I won't know until if I read the script and then it, it details specifically what what ethnicity, you know. And there's always that stereotype, oh, okay, the minority dies first or something, which is something I you know I hope that I don't get. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it, it's definitely definitely there. Um, I think less now than before but it's it's definitely in my head a lot of the time whenever i'm auditioning for sure and and so how do you um as as it sort of lays there in your head and as you're going through auditions what do you say to yourself well how, how do you convince yourself to keep going and say yeah. okay yep it's there and let's keep yeah. going basically it's just like it's it's always yeah it's always going to be there and with that that's going to mix with the self-doubt but it's, it's super simple. It's all self-talk, you know? It's just telling myself, hey, you know what? Sure, they might think that, but you don't have to. Because what you put out there, if you improve and you improve and you improve, they're not even gonna think about race. They're not even gonna think about you as the token minority. Because if your skill tells them that, hey, this guy's, no, you know what? Get him in here. Why? Because it's ta his talent speaks for itself. Or, you know, and, and that applies to everybody, I think. It's really just like, sure, that hurdle is there, but you zoom out, you just walk around the hurdle and keep walking forward. Literally, it's it's just, you know, it's it's there, but it's all up to the individual to get into that mindset to overcome it. So it sounds like what you're saying is, if it wasn't you, if you didn't do it, then who would? It's, it's like, yeah, exactly. And, and that's what I mean with the whole glass ceiling thing too as well, right? If it's been shown that to be done, and it's been shown to be done constantly, then, you know, somebody 15 years younger than me, they can, they can think it's, hey, this is a possibility. When I was even five years ago, I've only been acting for two years. Five years ago, I didn't think it was a possibility. I wanted to be a filmmaker because I didn't think that I could get the opportunity to be in front of the camera. And um, now I can, I'm able to do both. Um, and it's just at the beginning of the beginning, but it's still, it's there, it's materialized. And so it's just, it's, bringing a more optimistic mindset, I think, in, in my personal experience. So we just have a few minutes left and, and we can't really have this discussion and, and uh, without mentioning this next question that I'm going to, to, to uh, talk about. Uh, we've had several folks uh, ask similarly um, framed questions and merci pour votre question, Don. Thank you for your question, Don. Uh, and, and roughly translated, Doan writes, thank you for sharing this, which resonates very much with my experience as an adoptee in a Quebec family of French origin 40 years ago. My question is, if for the majority, First Nations do not belong to Canada, and it's a, a sentiment that we've heard before, how can I hope to belong no matter how long it takes? How does the treatment of First Nations people relate to the racism experienced by various minorities in this country? It's a very big question. Um, I, before we get to the, uh, 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 um, the, the let, me, let me reframe what I'm about to say here. Let, let's, uh, let's get a reaction. Um, May soon, uh, what do you think about, about that question and, and that, that sentiment? It's very uh, problematic, actually. It's connected to the colonization itself. Um, we experience colonization too, as uh, you know, people of Syria, let's say. We always say all nations occupied our country. 
So when you feel you are stranger in your own country, you are an outcast on your own soil, uh, you feel, how can I fit in? Even when you are in your country, you feel like you're an alien. So imagine when you are a newcomer to a country that um, experienced colonization, um, oppress you know, the, the people uh, of the land, and yet you have your own experience <laughs> with colonization. It, lots of layers here, and it's really, for me, difficult to absorb it and analyze it in a way that you know, can find a solution. Uh, what I can tell now, it's uh, problematic to me personally. Uh, sometimes I feel uh, I'm not better than uh, first settlers who came here because I came to the land, you know, do not belong to me, but it was open for me and for my people. Yet same things happen to me as an, an, an original person in my own land. So I, I don't know how to paraphrase it in a nice way, but uh, it's painful. That's what I can say. It's painful. It's, it's very hard. Jamie, uh, speechless. <laughs> May soon describes it as, as painful. Um, the, the, some of the, the racism that we see with indigenous and First Nations, uh, uh, First Nations folks, well, what, what is it like for you? How would you characterize it? Is it for me, this question? Uh, 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 this, is, this is for Jamie. OK. <laughs> Sorry, could you repeat the question? <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, so Misun was describing, was reacting to um, uh, the, the sentiment of um, anti-Indigenous racism. Um, and when you think about your context and some of the things that, that you've experienced in, in, your, uh, in your life, um, how would you characterize uh, how you feel when you when you hear that sort of sentiment or what, when, when you see that? Um, honestly, I personally want to feel that it's an idealistic concept that we just see a person as a person. And especially within the healthcare system, you don't want to look at what the color of their skin is, what their culture is. You want to see them as a patient that needs your help. Um, and Maybe that's why I went into the profession of nursing. I, I do have that innate um, ability to feel compassionate about other people and just want to purely help others. Um, and that does fall on the culture of Filipinos, as you know, Joe Koi makes that joke about um, Filipinos are usually nurses, and it's very true. Um, but uh, I think that's just a personal idea that I have, and I want to try and practice it as much as I can um, and try and share it with other people, regardless of whatever background they come from. Thank you. Dr. Mysore, um, this idea of uh, someone who doesn't see race, this is a question from Annie. Um, if, if the goal is, I, I don't see race, uh, how far away do you think we actually are from, from reaching um, a society where we are fully inclusive? Oh, click one more time. <laughs> we'll get you to click one more time there, Dr. Mysore. There you go. I'm having a problem with my buttons here. <laughs> That's okay. The person that says they don't see color, you know, this concept of color blindness, it is, um, I mean, you, you have to look at from the perspective of uh, uh, the evolution, you know, even though they might have overcome certain aspects of uh, race and color and they understand, uh, it's a lot of it is subconscious, unconscious behaviors that drive the prejudice. Um, so, you know, I've heard this, you know, racism is a learned behavior i'm good i don't see color but there's more to it than that and how do you get to the bottom of it is again very very complicated it's the history of colonization and and with the indigenous people you know they lost their language they lost their culture so what they need to do is get that back own it own their identity and and the sense of belonging will come likewise it, people who are saying that I don't see color, 
they don't superficially perhaps see color, but you know, there are certain biases and prejudices that exist. And maybe they're trying to overcome it by saying certain things. I mean, I'm not gonna judge them for what they say, but I think there's more to it than just what they see on the surface, the color. Mm. Um, it, it, the, the generational uh, uh, divide is also, um, uh, so my impression, and this is my impression as I speak with younger folks, um, and I have spoken with, with some elementary and high school students uh, when, when I was speaking about the NS, uh, the, the podcast, um, is that there seems to be a, a different appreciation for um, what anti-hate is, whether it's anti-Asian um, uh, anti -Asian hate or uh, uh, homophobia, transphobia, biphobia. Um, Alec, I wonder for you, as you listen to some of the things that we're talking about here, um, what what... What what comes to mind for you? Did were the experiences that, that you had? Uh, is it relatable to what you're hearing right now, or was it very different? Uh, I'd say everyone has a you know a different story. In a way, yes, there are some very relatable things. Um, me personally, I grew up here, and so it's kind of like uh, I, I don't want to say conditioned. That's not the right word. But it's like it's I've been kind of more used to hearing things like that, and in a way, it's kind of toughen me up in a way you know because like I'll hear something and I'll be like okay what's new like you know it, it it's kind of done that <clears throat> in in a in that perspective but uh yeah no definitely I, th I really do think there are a lot of re relatable things that I can apply to my own life and my past and I know that people that are watching right now as well I'm sure they can pick some pieces as well and apply that to their own because yes everyone does have a very individual very distinct story but if you break down all the little in-betweens we're all kind of living that same platform or same formula in a way mm -hmm. thank you for that i'm sorry you had to experience that that it's never okay to to have to hear yeah. those sorts of things right um jr mm -hmm. you were talking earlier about tokenism um we have a question uh <clears throat> From, from Sam, uh, who writes, how do you deal with non-Asian people who feel that they are, quote, the voice for the voiceless and choose to speak for you? Well, uh, uh, the, the other side of the, the tokenism um, uh, conversation, what do you think, JR? So the, the sorry, so the non-Asian speaking for the Asians, is that what you said? That's right, yes. Yeah. So the question is, how do you deal with uh, non-Asian people who feel that they are, quote, the voice of the voiceless, end quote, and choose to then speak for you. Yeah, no, and, uh, hopefully they're doing it because they know what they're talking about. Uh, and I, I say that with uh, sincerity because uh, there has been a lot of, um, call it, you know, bandwagon that, you know, oh yeah, I'm, you know, BLM, anti-Asian, but, and then you have those people that would say, uh, you know, how about BIPOC and, you know, do I really want to be called BIPOC? You know, do I really want to be called uh, whatever label it is? Um, I think what, what, what I'm more interested in conversation and dialogue is that, do you understand where I'm coming from? You know, uh, not because you, you have a flag, BLM or whatever, it doesn't mean you understand me. I think, and I think that that's the, uh, that's a problem is be because they, they, they see what's in the media, what they hear, whatever. And it, it does not mean that it's true. I mean, it could be one perspective, but I think what matters is the story behind the person. And, um, you know, the, um, don't take the ideology as per what Jamie said as being my truth, you know. Um, I actually, um, again, the, the, the character, the person of, going through the the, the uh, racism, the experience of it. Um, and for me, I made the conscious decision to make it a positive. You know, I could be one of those people that, um, you know, that really experienced mental health or whatever it is that the collateral damage of, uh, of that kind of experience. And, and obviously we don't want that, but, but I chose to, 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 to fight uh, in my mind uh, to be successful. And I think, Hopefully, the, hopefully we're all the same. But unfortunately, that is the world that we live in. And I think like, like what the Professor Tina said, uh, 
there there has to be a education you know and um, you know we we cannot just say that we cannot stand for something or be the voice for the voiceless without understanding their true experiences so um uh even if i may comment with the aboriginal uh uh the aboriginal our our brothers and sisters in the aboriginal community uh you know why are they treated differently by the government or even less you know if if that is how they feel and that is the truth uh, their truth it's too bad right i mean um this is their home and um after all we're all immigrants in their in their homes so and i think uh, there has to be solidarity in that to stand up for our indigenous brothers and sisters because uh if it's not for them there won't be any canada right and mm -hmm. and canada won't be it is what it is now for not for the immigrants that have helped to grow it so mm -hmm. thank you for that uh, uh, jr uh tina th this idea of belonging um how, how well, I mean, what, what does that mean for you and how challenging can that be? Because, uh, we've already heard from this discussion that it is a multi-layered thing. You know, I, uh, I, I identify as outside our gender binary. I'm not, I don't identify as a male or female um, person. When you, when you add those layers, how challenging can belonging be? I think it is such a loaded, loaded word. And I think that's where, um, you know, we always use it as shorthand and people often kind of express, do I feel a sense of belonging? Do I not feel a sense of belonging? And, you know, this, I think I'll just kind of link to what I have to say back to some of this conversation or also about solidarity, how we come to know what happens when someone else wants to speak for you. And these questions of ensuring that um, communities have voice, right, that individuals have voice. And I think as my soon sort of, um, I said right at the beginning of this conversation, finding opportunities where people feel like they can be their whole selves, that they can bring their multiple ways that they understand themselves into being comfortably with others who are gonna respect and seek to understand. And not that they're gonna understand the community, but really seek, do that work to understand each other. Um, and that you can find those people that you can kind of interact with. And that doesn't mean you're the same, right? It means that those complex intersectional identities that we all occupy, that we get to have those spaces. And I think, too often, um, we live in a world where, you know, the white savior attitude comes, um, people want to speak for those who are oppressed all the time, they want to save you, that is in fact colonialism, right, that is the roots of all of this, um, understanding that you somehow are better and that you can uplift others. Um, but I think ultimately, belonging has to be defined by community and the best work that we can do, you know, in solidarity with other communities, within our own communities, within our friend groups, is to keep pushing for those spaces like here today where people get to express what it means for them what would it mean for them to feel like they belonged not how does somebody else you know get you to participate in their program or you know allow you to be in a certain movie set or have you know workplace but what does it mean for people as they understand themselves and they understand themselves in community with others, in relationship with others. How then would they understand belonging? And then what do we need to do to get there? And I think that's the always the difficult question. You know, we've talked a lot about racism and I know we've really highlighted, I think, some incredibly touching personal experiences. Um, you know, I am an academic, so I also think in these terms that ultimately racism is not a stereotype. It's an ideology. It's a way of seeing the world that justifies and upholds structural inequities and it allows them to happen and perpetuates them. And so, you know, the good side to that is it takes a lot of work to keep it in place. So we can also equally work against it. But I think, you know, belonging, we have to take ownership and try and define it for what we want it to be. Otherwise it's defined from outside and that keeps the power and privilege in place. Dr. Mysore, uh, in, in your line of work, um... Uh, seeking understanding is is something that that can, can be key. Um, what advice would you give to folks who are who are listening? And I know we've gotten some questions uh, from from teachers asking for tools um, uh, for elementary students uh, to 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 talk about these sorts of things. What advice would you give to to someone um, who is taking part today uh, in terms of being able to help others? better understand where people are coming from? 
Well, it, it can start at any age. You know, children start to recognize that they are different from others just based on their superficial skin color. In fact, I understand there are programs now which should be uh, institutionalized in, in kindergarten, in grade one, on how to appreciate diversity, how to appreciate uh, one another and their strengths and get to know them. And that ultimately we, are all, we all belong to one race, uh, the human race. But it's the education should come not just from teachers, it should come from parents, uh, they should be allowed to, to speak about it, given a safe space so they can talk about it. You know, why aren't you playing with this friend today? Or why do you want to play with this friend today? And if that conversation, it's a, just a start, it's a, it's a start. And this, uh, what Tina was saying about a sense of belonging, um, you know, for immigrants like me, it, when I'm in India, Canada is home. When I'm in Canada, India is home. So I still, just still don't have a sense of belonging. I'm nowhere. <laughs> so, so that's, again, you said, Tina, take ownership. So that, that's been a struggle. There, there's a really good point that someone has made here um, describing our conversation. Um, more, uh, they see this more about combating anti-Asian oppression. Um, so when you, th and rather as, as much anti-Asian racism, um, I wonder if anyone has thoughts about that. How, how do you take it, I, I sort of see this as, how do you take it a step further if we were to acknowledge that, yes, um, we are in a world that, that uh, we face oppression, what's, what is the next level up? And uh, wave or go ahead and unmute yourself and if you, if you have something to say, otherwise I will pick on you. <laughs> Alec. Yes. How, how do you level sorry, up? I just got how like a you... flashback from university there. <laughs> like, I don't <laughs> want to get picked on. Anyway, sorry. So, so yeah, so how do you take this from acknowledging anti-Asian oppression to dealing with anti-Asian racism? Um, I'd say, well, to, I was just going to give an analogy to kind of hopefully open the conversation a little bit there. Um, this is just as there are, there is a war on drugs. This is a war on racism and hate. And so everyone has their battles and this is our battle. And so a war isn't just what you see in Lord of the Rings. It's not a bunch of people clashing in the middle. It's a comprise of smaller battles to make that, uh, I guess, ideology or enemy or whatever you wanna call it, smaller and smaller and smaller. And so I just wanted to add on that and see uh, what everyone thinks and wanted to add on with, onto that idea. <laughs> Jer, I think you unmuted your mic just before Alex uh, spoke, uh, so you're next. Yeah, no, it, it, yeah, it, it accept. Oh, sorry, we'll, we'll, we'll go to Jr. and oh. then we'll go to Tina. Go ahead, Jr. Oh, well, yeah, no, I think more more of the acceptance, uh, Russell. Um, I think it was Russell that asked and the acceptance, and again, what uh, Professor Tina said, the the conversation, right? Um, I think in some way, some form, we felt oppressed <laughs> in what life experiences, you know, <laughs> and I think that's the problem is the ideologies, the, uh, I think it's about, let's talk about the acceptance of, uh, of, of our fellow human beings, just like what Dr. Mooney said, and, and uh, it starts from the home, you know, you got to teach your kids how to accept other people as human beings, right? And, and, right. and so, so when you talk about acceptance, you mean acknowledging that, that oppression does exist. Is that what you mean? Yes, at our age. But when you're talking about kids, I mean, I got kids, so I can't talk about, you know, acceptance of oppression. And that's what I mean. Like, you got to accept acceptance of color. I mean, maybe let's start from there. Uh, acceptance that, uh, uh, for example, one, one of my twin, when we were walking, she saw grandma, it was a grandmother who was white. And then she said, oh, I have a different grandma, you know? So uh, it was cute, it was cute, uh, but she recognized that it's different, right? Uh, but she didn't say, how come that person is different, right? Like she was happy. And that's what I mean, like acceptance in small ways, uh, small successes, small wins that we're teaching our kids acceptance and, and um, and maybe that will combat the oppression or whatever uh, you might want to call it. Um, but you know, from what I'm hearing from from the panel, you know, you should, 
we're, we're human beings, we falter. And I think we just have to continue to, you know, claw our way back to being kind. <laughs> so. yeah. Dean, I mean, that, that's a good, a good point, right? How do you have a, an appropriate conversation, right? Because of course, depending on how old you are, um, the have, having that conversation can, can take different forms, right? So how do you have an appropriate conversation based on um, how old you are, how old one might be, or um, how much, um, what their contact, context is as well? Well, I think that's, you know, that is this question that we can think about when we think about the relationship between oppression, racism, you know, to me, they're completely intertwined. So I think I kind of missed the question there as well. I feel that, you know, once we acknowledge that we live um, in a world with systemic racism, that there are multiple forms of oppression, but that systemic racism creates the oppressions through the socioeconomic framework. Um, we're, you know, we're living through a pandemic. We know that it's had a disproportionate impact on people who are Indigenous, Black, people of color here in Winnipeg peg in the workplace. Um, women have lost jobs disproportionately. We know that various forms of oppression come forward. And so to me, the racism actually, you know, it's part of that framework. And I think actually that you can have these conversations with people of all ages. Um, you know, I have children. I talk about these things all the time because I think it's also, it's in the news. It's what they read. It's how they engage. And so finding our ways to have that kind of conversation that's open that doesn't make it seem like race is something that we shouldn't talk aloud about um, is actually a super important step to me. And so, you know, I think, you know, maybe my friends and others, you know, are sick of Tina's gonna say like, hey, you know, this was actually a story about race or, you know, I read the news and I say, why wasn't race part of that story? It so clearly is, but no one's um, comfortable saying the word. And I think just being able to say, we live in a racialized society people experience it as racialized. You know, those who claim that, and you know, I see in the quick Q&A, that they're colorblind actually are denying the categories through which they probably experience the world. People who say that tend to be privileged. They tend to be able to have, be a space can say like, don't worry, I don't see your race. And for many of us, I don't know, I, I won't speak for everyone on the panel, but for me, I say, then you probably don't see me or you're refusing to acknowledge how you've now interacted with me, how they're part of microaggressions, how you know I occupy an academic world as a you know woman of color, and that you know those who tell me that race didn't come into certain conversations deny those experiences. So I think the earlier you can acknowledge them um, and talk about them openly, because it's that idea that it's something that only grown-ups can talk about, or that we bracket, and that it's not polite. Um, you know, oppression is not polite, socioeconomic, you know, inequities are polite, but they exist and we have to talk about them and we need to address them. <laughs> Jamie, uh, how do you, uh, how have you had this conversation with, with uh, uh, folks around you? Because it is a difficult topic to, to, to bring up, right? So the questions uh, regarding, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I wonder um, in your experience, um, how have you been able to have the conversation about anti-Asian um, racism or, or oppression in general? Have you found a, a, a way that that's been um, useful in, in you being able to have that conversation with people? Um, for the most part, uh, I haven't actually had those conversations in the workplace. Uh, we are preoccupied with other priorities, to be honest. Um, but I do see it. I, I don't want to come off as someone that's sheltered and cannot even acknowledge other people's cultures. Um, but when you think about it, in my setting, there are protocols in place, there are priorities in place that I'm meant to help you help yourself in the context of a nurse patient relationship. Um, so, uh, it, in my personal experience, for sure, I haven't really had those in-depth conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and, uh, it's, uh, I, I wouldn't, uh, characterize it as, uh, someone who is, uh, insulated from, from experience. Your, your experience is your experience and, and, um, they, they are valid as, as they are. Mason, I want to ask you, uh, about this idea of, <laughs> of having this conversation with the effort of teaching. So uh, in the context of, say, a school teacher um, who has uh, young students, so, you know, grades three to seven, I say that that's young for me. <laughs> but but how, how do you have that conversation um, uh, so that folks understand and 
they're also able to think about it and and um, look into it for themselves. Well, I can talk as a mom and um, as a person who worked at school also first when I came to Canada. In my perspective, children understand. Never say, oh, they are little, they don't understand. Oh, uh, we, we have to be very careful. You know, this might break their emotion. No, they have to face the truth. It's the way how you convey the uh, conflict or problem or the issues. Uh, be honest, just discuss these things with them, what's happening around the world. Use certain, let's say, documentaries, talk about um, uh, certain topics that really uh, harming the you know, human rights, uh, not only for, for anti-racism, in general, for example, I remember my daughters were two years old, like uh, the oldest, I start talking to her about different issues around the world when she was two. And I followed with her sister as well. Everything you can imagine, the acceptance, the racism. And I used to hear lots of you know, criticism from people around me, like they are very young, they don't understand. And I'm like, no, they do understand. When you start in a very early age and try to, to put this uh, critical thinking uh, in their mind and push them to, to evaluate what is right, what is wrong. Uh, what is accepted, what is not accepted. The struggle is part of our life. Okay, how can we overcome this struggle? So in the matter of education, uh, in my perspective, the best way is to talk openly, to share ideas, and also hear from the students, because I'm telling you, I heard lots of racist comments from my students before, with not knowing it, it was racist, because their parents will say it at home, the students will also you know, reflect on it in, in the class. So it's our job to tell them, okay, this is not acceptable. This is the case. This is the picture. Th that's how I see it. Yes, Mooney, I can see you. <laughs> Dr. My Dr. Meiser, I, I wanna ask you this question and I think it is, uh, it is an important uh, uh, question. Um, uh, someone, uh, uh, Klilu, uh, and my apologies if I didn't pronounce your name correctly, asked uh, uh, this question. Why are folks from privileged groups not included in this discussion? Don't you think that they too are part of the solution? Dr. Mysore, I wonder what do you think of that question? Well, you know, I would consider myself privileged, but on the other hand, I work with a lot of underprivileged people, marginalized people, just from my profession. So at the top level, when it comes to discussion, I can tell you what I'm a new grandmother. I have a, a granddaughter that's seven weeks old. And my daughter is was an active youth volunteer with Asian Heritage Society. So she was already there. We've talked about race and, and youth. So they, she and her husband are going to start showing people of different colors to their baby to start explaining because even babies understand when someone doesn't look like their mother or their father or looks like something different they're starting that education at that level and that's where it should begin you know parents should take responsibility for how they raise their children because they're bombarded with this media you know the racism the stereotypes it's all around you but the education starts with at home in a nurturing environment by the parents uh, we uh, are very quickly running out of time, um, and so I'm, I'm just going to go to each of our panelists for some thoughts before we go. And, and uh, again, the, the purpose of this chat is, is to think about what we can take away uh, from folks who are listening. What can they do um, after they leave this, this conversation? Um, maybe we'll go to uh, JR. JR, what, any, any final thoughts? Yeah, and th thank you for this opportunity. It's been great. Uh, I feel like I learned a lot um about myself and others and the question but li listen i mean we we gotta do uh we have to do what is best for us so you know whoever you are uh keep showing who you are keep showing that beautiful character uh despite of you know where you came from it's not about that i think uh people around you um not everybody in the world is racist. Just the same thing that McLean said that Winnipeg is a racist city. 
which is, you know, obviously there's racism wherever you go in every corner of the world. But I think what matters is the people around you that, that would like to see you for who you are. You don't need to bother about people that doesn't want to see you for who you are, because obviously, you know, why, why fight something that they don't want to see? I, I think, um, yeah, we all have a beautiful young life to live. It's one life. So keep living the life that you love and show that to the people around you and just be who you are, you know, um, and it will be up to them to accept who you are, accept your talents, just like what Alex said, and not see you as a, you know, as a token. So, you know, I, I, I hope, uh, I hope you guys will continue to represent your communities. I love representing my community. I hope I will see you guys uh, in the future and hear about you in the future. Thank you, Faith. Thank you, JR. Jamie, any final thoughts? Um, basically, it's just to be very self-aware of what's going on around you. And um, just to touch base on what JR is saying is be okay with who you are, where you come from. And as Alex said, let your talent speak for itself. So what do you have to offer? Let that resonate before they even see you as an ethnic, uh, particular ethnic culture. Thank you. Dr. Mysore? My take home message would be this concept of cultural humility it doesn't have to be just in the healthcare fields. So it's a lifelong learning process and self reflection of your own biases, your own prejudices, and what you bring when you are interacting with others. I mean, it's all subconscious, you know, so be aware of that, those subconscious uh, behaviors that do come out. And you know, how do you correct that? Be aware of it first and then correct it. I'll just give you an example of an extreme example and I'll be quick. Uh, uh, be focused on the goal. And this is an example of a marathon runner who's running at the end, he's tired, he needs water, but there's only one Arab standing there with the glass of water. The Arab who he sees as a terrorist. If he's thirsty, he'll take the water. He's not going to say, well, he's a terrorist, so I'm not going to take his water. So focus on the goal, which is in this case, quenching your thirst. And challenge, whenever you see imbalances, challenge it. Uh, take your institution into account uh, for, I mean, ask them to be accountable when you see things happening around you. It's very easy to, easy to say, look, we're great. Look at our, uh, we write up, we've got everything. We treat everyone fairly, but it may not be happening. So bring them, challenge them. Thank you, Dr. Mysore. Tina? Well, I think I would um, just say, and I think it just goes to the question of, you know, why are we, you know, only talking about this among people who, um, you know, present or identify as Asian? And I would say, you know, share the message, talk with friends who you might consider allies, but for all of us to always kind of genuinely engage and try and understand both the histories and experiences of racism and how those aren't the same for everybody and what we can learn from them. But then respect the emotional labor that this work takes. And I think, you know, the burden does fall often, whether it's institutionally, in your own families, in your communities, on those who um, are from racialized groups. So respect that emotional labor. And for those who have the capacity, engage. Engage as much as you can. And when you are too tired, find the support to take care of yourself. Because I think as um, Dr. Resor said, it is an ongoing um, and likely never ending process. So, you know, engage, but take care as well. Me soon. My last uh, thoughts actually um, are going to be a call to everyone. When you witness any racism, any act of racism or injustice, please step in. Your voice is very important. If everyone, each one of us, will step in to say, no, that's not acceptable, stop. I'm telling you, things will change drastically. But the thing is, we live in a very passive society. When you encounter something, you will say, this is not none of my business, move on. No, if you think that fire in your neighbor's house is your neighbor issue, it's your issue too. So please step in, advocate for people, and let's build a great community together. Thank you, Mason. Alec? Um, I'd say just 
you know, don't be afraid to ask friends, to ask family about their experience, uh, respectfully, of course, because, you know, everyone here, everyone has their very, very special story of their life. And so I know that people that are watching this, they have those people around them as well. And so just to learn a bit about them and to really understand it, I think is, is a really big thing. Um, and support local filmmakers. You know, a lot of Asian filmmakers here in Winnipeg, Vince Tang comes to mind, great guy. Um, yeah, otherwise, I think everyone's pretty much said what I've probably wanted to touch on. Thank you, Alec. Maraming salamat, everyone. Thank you very much. And thank you to our interpreters uh, who have done a tremendous job in, uh, in, in uh, interpreting uh, both uh, in American Sign Language and uh, in, in written form. So thank you. And in verbal form. Thank you. Uh, I'm Faith Fundal. Thank you. You can find me on all of the social media apps at Faith Fundal. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And I know that we've gone much longer than uh, I was hoping for. Thank you for participating. And uh, Thank you for having an open mind. Thank you, Faith. Uh, thank you to our presenters and thank you for joining us from home. Uh, the recording for our event will be posted on the CMHR Facebook page once bilingual captions have been added. Keep checking our website and follow us on social media if you want to be alerted to future museum events. Join us in June as we mark Indigenous History Month. I hope you have a great afternoon. Ceci conclut notre programme. Merci à nos intervenants et à nos modérateurs. Merci de vous être joints à nous depuis chez vous. L'enregistrement de l'événement sera publié sur la page Facebook du MCDP une fois que les sous-titres bilingues auront été ajoutés. Continuez à consulter notre site web et à nous suivre sur les médias sociaux si vous voulez être informé des futurs événements du musée. Joignez-vous à nous en juin à l'occasion du Musée national de l'histoire autochtone. Merci. <rires>